Okay, everyone, let's get started. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. McCormick to uh, give us our lecture today. He uh, was kind enough to send me a few things about his CV. He's Professor of Medicine and the William E. Colson Endowed Chair in Gerontology. I had to look up who William Colson was. You can correct me, an Oregonian who sort of started the senior living uh, communities around the country, I think. So uh, that's a great thing. He's board certified in hospice, palliative care, medicine, and geriatrics. He does a lot of other stuff. He's been the medical director at Bailey Boucher since 1990, uh, ever-present person at Harborview. And on a personal note, I'll just say that I remember Wayne from my very first weeks at Harborview Medical Center as an intern in medicine in 1991, and I've uh, seen him, I think, every year since then, and he's always got a great smile and great disposition and uh, kind uh, words. So uh, without more, Dr. McCormick. Great. Well, thank you all for having me. Claire, in addition to sending me to the wrong room, gave me instructions about what to talk about today. And it sounds like the themes have been five new things in X, five new things in movement disorders, five new things in seizures, what have you. So this is five new things in geriatrics. And what I thought I would do is uh, derive some words of wisdom from uh, some recent meetings at the American College of Physicians and American Geriatric Society. Uh, just a couple of months ago. So I picked things that geriatricians are talking about. And actually, my plan is to learn a little bit more from you than you from me today. I'd kind of like to get your gaze on a few things that internists and geriatricians are a little bit worried about these days. What will we talk about and get concerned about? In geriatrics, it's, it's a strange slant on things. We have a gaze a little bit different than internists. We practice in this strange land of universal single-payer health care coverage called Medicare. All of our patients have the same insurance, same stuff. It's kind of interesting. I uh, kind of almost take it for granted in senior care clinic. But the, the population is getting remarkably old. The average age in senior care clinic where I just came from is 88. So that's the average. It, the norm is to see one or two patients over 100. There's thousands of people over 100 years old in the Seattle megalopolis, so it's not even newsworthy to be 100 anymore. It's like, big deal. You know, go down the block, there's another person that's 102. Uh, so it's, it's kind of interesting. There's so many older people, and most of them are remarkably healthy. Um, so... It's kind of interesting. And I mean, it even goes to our presidential candidates. So I thought, I, you know, they're 70, you know, give or take here. It's kind of interesting. Most of our presidents haven't been that old, but we're headed into the presidential theme this year. So I've peppered in some presidential quiz questions for you. The, and I, I, Eric shared with me earlier that uh, most of the department of neurology, I'm told, is our Trump supporters. So I just, want, <laughs> I just want you to know that this will be completely nonpartisan. This is purely historical. And I actually want to leave you with the feeling that, you know, no matter what happens, things are going to be all right. So that's the main theme today. <laughs> right. So the first one, Kimmy told me that she, pres she presented this paper to uh, the Neurology Journal Club, too, because we talked about it in Journal Club. Isn't that right? Yeah. Kim? Yeah, okay. Well, anyway, so this is uh, the finger trials talked up in among neurologists, too. And what's another theme of the talk today is, is acronyms. You know, we have acronyms for all our studies. And some of them are really contrived. FINGER in Finland, this trial is done in Finland, stands for the Finnish Geriatric Intervention Study to Prevent Cognitive Impairment Disability. FINGER. 
<laughs> and I, I have a friend from Helsinki, Birgitta, and asked her, you know, what's finger in Finnish? And she said a word that, I'm telling you, it did not sound like finger. So, <laughs> could be. Phil thinks maybe Swedish. Could be. <laughs> but what's, good, what's kind of cool about this trial is this is exactly how geriatricians think. We think in terms, in syndromic terms. Here's, here's the way a geriatrician thinks about falls, for instance. We think about all the things that might play into this syndrome of falls in an older person and come up with every imaginable factor that might pertain to an individual and then intervene on all those factors in hopes of making things a little bit better. And sometimes it makes things a lot better, but usually it makes things a little bit better. But the idea is you throw in everything, including the kitchen sink, to come up with something good. And that's what they did in the finger trial. It's a multi-domain intervention of diet, exercise, cognitive training, uh, vascular risk factor control. Uh, you know, it's like a full-time job for these people. And here's finger, spells finger, right? Fagisposid. Anyway, uh, a multifactorial approach, randomized, ended up with about 600 people in each arm, and it helped a little bit. Uh, it's, it, uh, they, they used a fairly complex, comprehensive cognitive test, and they found that um, overall scores improved in everybody, including the controls, but much better if, with regards to executive functioning and processing speed in the intervention part, but not the memory. So I circulated the, the graph of the results, which I bet most of you have, have seen before. And I thought I would ask you, because we were puzzled in Geriatrics Journal Club about how come memory didn't change, but the other ones did? And I, I wondered if there was some reason that would pop out to a neurologist that would not occur to a geriatrician or internist of why memory didn't change, but the other cognitive realms improved. Kimmy, did you guys come up with anything in Journal Club? Yeah, it's been a little while since I thought about yeah. it, but I think part of it, um, you know, that there was a lot of emphasis on vascular health. Yeah. And when we think about that as you know, having a bigger impact on the prefrontal executive function. Uh-huh. So that can be part of it. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, we always do have the question of sort of what, what measures are, are people calling memory measures? What measures are people calling executive function measures? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wonder. Go ahead. Well, being geri somewhat geriatric myself, I, the only journal I read now is Lancet Neurology. The current one had some. I think it was about Alzheimer's. I can't remember the Alzheimer's or MS. But they mentioned two things in these uh, trials, and one was the, the placebo effect, and you mentioned a, a placebo effect, the negative effect. <laughs> but the other one was a Hawthorne effect. So it's not only a placebo effect. There's the fact that you were being monitored. Sure. And seen regularly. Right. And then poor performance significant passage. Absolutely, because look at the controls there. I mean, they got better too on that graph. So clearly there's a lot, you know, people are learning how to do these cognitive tests. Uh, it's just that it seemed like the intervention study was learning better for some reason, at least in a couple of realms of cognition, not so much memory. I wondered if there was even an anatomic reason. You know, let, let's say, because these patients really had mild cognitive impairment. They were picked to be a little cognitively impaired, but did not have the diagnosis of dementia and were certainly not normal. And maybe in early, you know, kind of MCI, I know there's a, a memory uh, or predominant form of MCI, maybe, <clears throat> yeah, kind of on average, that was predominant somehow in Finland. I don't know. Go ahead. What, what were the mix of Yeah, they were picked. And also, yeah. patients Sure. Yep. Really homogeneous. I mean, you can imagine Finland. Yeah. A lot of people who look like you and me. Yep. Could be. 
Right. And it, it's hard to tease it apart, and they almost designed it to not tease it apart. The purpose of this study was to throw in everything in the kitchen sink and see, see what, if it worked in amalgam. Uh, and they're going to follow up these people like in seven years or something to look at dementia outcomes, which was not part of this study. So they did not do dementia outcomes here. But this is, this is curious to geriatricians in particular, because this is actually the way we function. We tell our patients with dementing illness to, you know, we work on their vascular risk factors, we work on their diet, we have them exercise, we have them get socially engaged and do, uh, you know, kind of memory enhancement type of activities. So that's actually what, what we do. And it, it kind of uh, helped us verify that at least it helps a little bit in some realm. But the, the long term uh, will remain to be seen. So some aspects get better, but non-memory. The clinical significance of the differences is not clear. Uh, unable to know which component. Uh, and then the dementia outcome will be in the future. Great. So, so I would say that, that your, your last two comments about the anatomical piece, I would think you were on to something with that because it, it's possible in a way this fits with the recent Framingham paper on dementia that was in the New England Journal. Uh -huh. And their conclusion, and it was very cautiously called dementia. And their right. conclusion was that the incidence of dementia has been decreasing in Framingham right. over the last 40 or 50 years. Like cardiovascular, and the outcomes and have decreased. Yeah. Because there was less smoking. Mm -hmm. Blood pressure and cholesterol were better controlled. And the people who had the diagnosis of probable Alzheimer's, that incidence did not change. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So okay. it could be that the, the memory people here have early Alzheimer's and the others are more vascular. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea, Tom. It could be. Well, let's talk about presidents a little bit. Name this president. I bet some of you guys will get this one. This president had at least one major myocardial infarction right before he was elected. Then he had three crises during his presidency. He had an, another big MI with an LV aneurysm. Had severe Crohn's disease and got his, a big part of his guts whacked out. Also had a TI with stroke with expressive aphasia. I think, but didn't you used to call, it, it went away, but over a couple of days. So it used to call that a RIND, yeah, right? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but get this, he didn't miss a day of work. <laughs> and would not hand over his responsibility to the vice president. Uh, Eisenhower. Eisenhower. Right, Ike. Yeah, I mean, you'd expect a five-star general, you know, gets his guts whacked out and says, I'm getting right back in there. You know? I don't know. This was in the 60s, right? Late 50, mid 50s, early 60s? If you watch his farewell speech, you can actually detect some of his aphasia. Really? Yep. Uh-huh. Mark, Mark Dykin was my department chair. He used to show that to the graduating and residents every year. Yeah, but he's the quintessential 50s guy, right? Bald, you know, mid-50s, president, lots of, lots of cardiovascular disease. He's just like a wet, like none of my wets would come in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and who was his vice president? Right, Richard Nixon. So he, would, he, did, he hated Nixon's guts, right? So he's not going to turn over the presidency to Nixon. Not for one minute. <laughs> so any, you know, anyway, we did nothing for this kind of thing back then. No statins, no, not very good blood pressure control, you know, none of the things that we have in our armamentarium these days. It wasn't that long ago. Do you develop dementia? I don't know. I don't know about dementia. But he had a lot of stuff, right? So... Anyway, but no, certainly no statins. So geriatricians, you know, we do a lot of medicine stopping. You know, when people come to clinic, we, 
we stop their denepozil, we stop their statins, we stop their plavix, we, <laughs> all the things that uh, we all prescribe. But we, we start them a lot too. So this was a study by a geriatrician in Denver. She's also a palliative medicine doc like myself and looked into discontinuing statin therapy in the setting of advanced life-limiting illness, which is mostly older people with multimorbidity in this particular study. Uh, but it was a randomized trial. Some people got stopped, some didn't, and uh, the observers didn't know which was which. So the idea was, well, does it hurt anybody to stop statins, even though they've been put on for very good reasons? <clears throat> uh, and may maybe might even something good happen. So she uh, enrolled 381 adults who were guessed to have a life expectancy of, it was the old surprise question, would you be surprised if they died within the next year or so? And if the answer was, nope, wouldn't be surprised, that was a legitimate subject for the study. <laughs> half got it, stats withdrawn, half kept them. And the results are here, and you can see that the survival is actually a little bit uh, better among people who discontinued statin therapy, but you know, not statistically significant. Their reported quality of life was improved. This is an overall general quality of life instrument. So the result of that was you can stop statins in this type of setting if you wouldn't be surprised if somebody's life was limited without increasing their risk for early death and perhaps increasing quality of life. So this gets, gets talked up a lot among geriatricians because we do stop medicines a lot. And here's what we employ in, in senior care clinic where our patients are average age, you know, 88, 90 years old. Uh, we ask patients these three questions. Hey, come on in, Bruce. Uh, we, we line, you know, we, we have people bring their medicines in a sack and line them up on the desk. And we say, you know, mo lots of people have find it hard to take this many medicines. Which ones are you not taking? Not which are you taking? Which ones are you not taking? Mm -hmm. And they say, well, I'm not, actually, I'm not taking any of them. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, you know, they, they might pick out a couple or, or none. They might say, nope, I'm religious, I take them all. And then we say, which ones would you like to stop? Which ones do you not like taking? And they may or may not pick some. And then we say, which, would you like suggestions from me about which ones to stop? On average, this reduces the overall pharmacy for a patient population, senior patient population, about 20%. Uh, some patients end up on no medicines. They say, I, you know, actually, I don't take any of them. I feel pretty good. I want to stop all of them. That's, that's uncommon. And it's also uncommon, but rarely happens, that you actually end up with one or two more medicines after the discussion. But on average, you end up eliminating a couple. So this is just practice pearl, how we do it. Okay, let's do another president quiz. What do you say? This president died of a hemorrhagic stroke. Wait, you have to let me finish asking. <laughs> Due to hypertension. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, FDR, exactly. Here's his blood pressures during his last year of administration. <laughs> yeah. Some people think it might have been related to the fact they had polio, but sometimes it, it trigger it makes sense some things about the uh, blood pressure system. Also. Yeah. It makes it but yeah, he didn't do doodly squat about it. Yeah, right. <laughs> no pills, right? So, and here here he is in the middle with Joe and Wynn thinking about what to do with Europe after World War II. <laughs> But here's the result, he died. You know, he died while in office of a cerebral hemorrhage and handed things off for the last few months of his administration to Harry S. Truman, right? Who then had to decide whether to drop the bomb or not, right? Fresh into the presidency. Talk about responsibility. But yeah, I mean, uh, but these days, again, I'm gonna look to you to find out what you all think of the sprint trial, because this gets a huge amount of uh, play among internists and geriatricians because we're taking care of these really old people and it's sometimes a little spooky to try to aim for a systolic under 120 which is what this was all about 
and they've published more and more papers saying, no, it really is okay to lower the blood pressure, the systolic pressure below 120 in people over age 75. And we continue to say, well, that can't be for everybody. Surely it, that hurts some people to lower it that much in people who have, don't have the same vasomotor response that they once did when they were 50 or 20. But the aim of SPRINT, which, uh, I mean, th this one actually makes a little bit of sense. SPRINT stands for systolic blood pressure intervention trial. So you can get S-P-R-I-N-T out of that. Okay, I'll give it to him. Uh, so that's the question. Uh, lot, you know, huge N, uh, and uh, the target for one group was less than 120, the other less than 140. And even among people who are older, uh, the composite outcome was reduced. This trial was stopped, as you guys probably know, early because they didn't think it was ethical to continue because the outcomes were so good in, their, in the interventional group. And they insisted that the negative outcomes of lowering the blood pressure that much were negligible. Not a big deal. More common, but you know, not very common. What do you guys think? I mean, is, do you guys drive blood pressure down in your patients like this? You, you, you have a particular gaze on this blood pressure lowering thing. What were you gonna say? Oh, sorry, I would just have a question. Is that specific to, so this is just whatever blood pressure medicine they were on. It's not like asynchronous or whatever. It's not a class of, you know, they didn't. Well, they used ACE inhibitors, okay. beta blockers, yeah. So you, you don't know if it's a blood pressure thing? Yeah, they're just aiming for these targets using the medicines they need, whether it's two or three or four agents, right? Mm -hmm. We're saying that they did. Yeah, it's a good Go ahead. There's been at least one, I don't know, it was a large control study that showed that uh, if you lower uh, uh, diastolic, uh, systolic much below 150, you get some prime decline in cognitive uh, difficulty. Yeah. Increased cognitive difficulty. Yeah. Right. So, I, so clinically, we as neurologists, I think, we see that less than 5% population. They, they come into the emergency room or the hospital with, and they have lost consciousness. Right. They've had an episode of loss of consciousness. And you discover, in fact, that they were taking what we considered too much of their blood pressure medication to get their blood pressure too low. So right. It may be a small number, but it can be significant for that individual. They can actually have a syncopal episode, and if it's while they're driving, it's a big problem. Right, or just feel bad. You know, if people are kind of posturally hypotensive off and on, just, you know, they just feel crummy when you lower it that low. Go ahead. Yeah, and I think if you look at, at patients who are already prone to cardiovascular disease, they have a stiffer heart, so they don't tolerate blood pressure lowering as well. They're more likely to have carotid or vertebral stenosis, which means the blood pressure that actually gets to the other side of that stenosis is not as good. As, as it ought to be. And then depending on the, the blood pressure medication that's being used, they may also be susceptible to a secondary side effect called hyponatremia. So low blood pressure and hyponatremia is really going to whack them. Sure, yeah. Well, we take care of these, uh, us geriatricians, and you guys too take care of people with diabetes, renal failure, a little heart failure from the stiff ventricle, people with dementia in the skilled facilities. Those were excluded from this trial, right? You know, rightly so for a big trial like this. But that, that's our patient population, and we do see a lot of the negative sequela of driving blood pressure down too much. So we're still spooked, even though the SPRINT investigators continue to hammer on us, no, this is good. You guys should be aiming for lower blood pressures. Still, you know. So David, what do the stroke people think about this? Well, um, you know, I think if you were dealing with a pretty healthy older person, which may be more of the people that were involved in the trial, mm. might be a more reasonable thing to do. Uh, you know, every stroke patient is different, and depending on the status of the stenoses in their large arteries, you definitely will approach things uh, differently. So I don't think there's a pat answer, um, but. You know, I, I, certainly this has encouraged us to be a little bit more aggressive than we have been in the past, 
but we still don't necessarily, you know, shoot for pre-syncopy. You know. Yeah, yeah. Still a little spooked about it. Go ahead, Bruce. There, there's, uh, there's no question there's been a huge amount of controversy about this. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I judge it a little bit from my own personal perspective. Uh, it would make me a patient uh, because my blood pressure is frequently 130 systolic or even 135. And prior to this, I thought, oh, I'm pretty, yeah. doing pretty good. So I think that there's some... Uh, hesitancy to think that a huge new additional uh, adult senior population is going to be on a medication subsequent to uh, this study. Yeah, yeah. So e even though what happened to FDR notwithstanding, this is still a big debate, you know, what to do about blood pressure. It's interesting. <laughs> We're still, still thinking about it. Okay, let's do another president question. Which president did allow his vice president to serve as acting president during a medical procedure. Not Ike. He wouldn't let Tricky Dick be president even for a minute. Nope. Not George Washington? Bush? Right. George W. Bush allowed Dick Cheney to be president for a couple hours. Oh, I thought he was president. While he got the last <laughs> Quite right. Quite right, Phil. He was president for two hours. This is Pres President Cheney delivering an executive order about to the gastroenterologist about how, where to go with the colonoscope. <laughs> Think about it. Again, that's why, uh, this makes me kind of uh, feel warm and cuddly. You know, we're going to be okay no matter what happens. We're going to be okay with this. No matter who our president is. So, we, but this is also a big deal because we, you know, in senior care clinic and internists do a lot of sending people to procedures, colonoscopies, etc. And the lower up till recently is, well, if people have AFib and they're on uh, Coumadin, we should bridge them. We should be given heparin, you know, stop the Coumadin five days before, give the heparin in between, and then ramp them up and bridge them back up on Coumadin. And the question was, well, do you actually need to do that? Or should you just stop the Coumadin, get the colonoscopy a few days later, and then just start the Coumadin again? Forget the heparin altogether. So this is the bridge trial. This makes a little sense because it's the bridging anticoagulation in patients who require temporary interruption of warfarin therapy for an elective invasive procedure or surgery. But bridge is the first word, so we'll give them the acronym <laughs> here. Uh, so AFib, uh, and the guidelines weren't entirely clear. So a little bit cumbersome going through all this permutations of uh, the heparin piece. So patients over 18 on warfarin, uh, and they had CHAD scores that were, you know, not that high, but elevated at least. No renal failure, no recent embolism, nor DVT, no valves. So just health, you know, otherwise healthy people with AFib getting, needing it stopped for some reason. So they stopped the war from five days before and then were randomized to either get uh, daltaparin or not, but they got, you know, got... Uh, a th sham therapy if they didn't get the daltaparin, and then started up the warfarin right after the procedure or whatever it was, let the INR come up. Some of them were on daltaparin, some of them not. And here's the patient characteristics. So mean CHAD score is only 2.3, not that high. Uh, some had LV dysfunction. Uh, a number of these procedures were laparotomies or GI surgery slash endoscopies some cardiothoracic, you know, valves and those kinds of, you know, putting in pacemakers, that kind of thing, and orthopedic. Uh, <clears throat> and no difference was found in embolic events a month after this. Uh, the, there were some events, they were uncommon, but they occurred like, you know, three weeks later, two and a half weeks later. Uh, majoring or bleeding was more common in the group that got the delta parent, monkeying around with their INR. So, uh, there was no difference in mortality, PE or MI. 
So uh, the thing is, you know, again, we take care of people with chads of nines and, you know, pretty high, so I'm not sure it applies to them. But it looks like it was pretty safe. Again, it didn't apply to people who were getting valves or, you know, had other things like that. So it may or may not apply to the patients we take care of, or many of them around here, but, you know, kind of nice to not have to do it once in a while. So for most surgical procedures, warfarin could be held if deemed safe to resume post-op. Uh, un unclear how it applies to the new, you know, Pradaxa and the new anticoagulants. Mm -hmm. But we'll see, because they're going to study that pretty soon. I think we still get more because the patients we get are the ones that have the stroke <laughs> while they're being bridged. Mm. Yeah. Or, or while they're not being bridged. Or yeah. So another they kind of drop down. selection yeah. bias, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, here's a tough one. Let's see if you get this one right. What was the middle name of the sitting president thought to have at least mild cognitive impairment, if not Alzheimer's disease, during his administration? What's the middle name? How many votes for Wall? Woodrow, Gibson, Wilson, Clayton, that was Wilson, Ronald Wilson Reagan, very patriotic. In case you didn't get the flag up front, they put another one behind you. <laughs> just, to, just so you really you know, notice how patriotic this guy is. Again, this gives me solace. <laughs> that no matter what happens, we're going to be okay. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, this gets talked up a lot as a study to be poo pooed. Uh, PPI and risk of dementia. Is this something you all have have looked at? This was a, this is uh, this is big data gone. Malignant. Uh, it, it's true that PPI, you know, PPI have lots of possible side effects, but you know, people take them like candy. I bet half of you are taking PPIs. Uh, certainly, everybody in Washington D.C. They've got to be on. You know, all of them are taking PPIs, right? It's too much stress up there. But there's risks for lots of things: you know, B12 deficiency, C diff, community-acquired pneumonia. Lots of possible side effects. So this study was, uh, some Germans looked at the German database, an enormous database of health utilization and diagnoses, medications, to look at the association of PPIs with the risk of dementia. So it's actually a claims data analysis. Uh, all right. Uh, so, and they, they, they based, you know, the kind of uh, biologic, uh, plausibility on the fact that PPIs do cross the blood-brain barrier and in mice have been associated with beta amyloid deposition. Uh, no problem with a uh, large N here, 70,000 German patients uh, over a seven-year period. Insurance claims data uh, and diagnostic codes and prescriptive information. Now, you know, the Germans are, you know, meticulous people. And I'm sure they entered the information right, but you can imagine all kinds of uh, confounders and uh, biases that might come into a database like this. Like when do the diagnoses get recorded? When do the meds get recorded? Are they right? Uh, but they're looking for an association with PPI use and dementia. The first thing they figured out was, well, okay, there's lots of confounders. They looked at uh, any these and more and were able to show that the uh, odds ratios were all over the map and different among people with dementia who were in different subgroups of these 70,000 had uniquely different odds ratios. But they had no trouble getting statistical significance because they're looking at 70,000 people. Whether this is, it has any factual basis uh, and certainly whether it's clinically significant or not, regardless of its factual basis, is what people say probably there's not much there there. <clears throat>
but overall they showed uh, a ratio, uh, you know, a risk ratio of 1.66. And when they stuck in all those, they called it controlling. But us biostatisticians in the crowd know that you don't control for a confounder. You slam it into a logistic regression and see how, what comes out the other end. That's different than controlling for that variable. And it was still significant. Again, they got 70,000 subjects. But uh, the weaknesses are this is a big administrative database. Other confounders were present, not just may have been present. Uh, and it certainly does not prove causation. So this is soundly poo pooed among geriatricians and internists. But, uh, you know, people take, you know, everybody's on PPI, so we do try to stop them. But people are pretty wedded to them. You know, they, they feel better and want to keep taking them. So we let them, by and large. There's certainly no proof that PPIs cause dementia. There's this statistical association. Uh, and PPIs have been associated with osteoporosis and renal failure, again, without causing causation. And there's probably a lot of people taking them that don't actually need them, but these are over the counter after all. So we have a little control over that other than our suggestions. Okay, wow, we're actually doing pretty well on the time here, even though I got started late. So I've got time for number six here. This is the sixth thing. This was actually presented at the American Geriatric Society, even though it was a study that appeared in pediatrics uh, this past year, September of 2015. Uh, it may or may not have anything to do with the results of the convention this week. But let me go through the study and see if you think it has anything to do with, with it or not. Uh, this was a study, a randomized controlled trial of rudeness. I do not jest. It really was. Uh, because you, you all have probably experienced this. You know, when somebody's rude or just obnoxious, it throws you off your game, right? Uh, and it may or may not result in harm to a patient or at least, if nothing else, harm to the ambiance of the room. Iatrogenesis often results from performance deficiencies among medical teams and their members. Team-targeted rudeness may underlie such performance deficiencies. I really like the way they worded it. So let me describe this trial. This was done in Israel, in Tel Aviv. Uh, 24 neo, that does not stand for neuro-intensive care unit, that's neonatal intensive care unit teams. 24 teams with 72 Israeli physicians and nurses were exposed to this trial. Uh, the teams were these subjects. This was a training simulation, not care of an actual patient, so it was one of these training simulation things involving a preterm infant getting sicker in the ICU due to necrotizing enterocolitis. <laughs> Team performance was evaluated elegantly with three independent judges who assessed diagnostic performance, procedural performance, you know, kids in, in ICUs get a lot of procedures, and information sharing and help seeking, the dynamic of the team's conversations with each other and with others using you know, wonderful scales, uh, and, and they were blinded to who got the rudeness and who didn't. So the intervention was partic participants were informed that a foreign expert on team reflexivity would be observing them, among other people, uh, observing them. And the teams were randomly assigned to either exposure to rudeness, rudeness, this expert made comments that were mildly rude, uh, but unrelated to the team performance, not rude to them as people, just kind of rude generally. Uh, or control, just neutral comments like, you know, wow, it's, uh, it's warm in here or something like that. <laughs> and it was videotaped and evaluated, okay? So here's some of the rude comments, just to ground this for you. Uh, I'm not impressed with the quality of medicine in Israel. Yeah. 
I'm not impressed with the quality of medicine at UW Medical Center. Medical staff wouldn't, like those observed I hear, wouldn't last a week in my department. <laughs> I hope I won't get sick. <laughs> <laughs> but not to the person. Like, you know. I hope Phil Swanson. <laughs> Phil Swanson wouldn't last a week in my department. <laughs> it's not like that. It's like just the general. <laughs> I've heard that for years. <laughs> <laughs> So here's, here's the results. Team exposed to rudeness had significantly worse diagnostic scores. This isn't a big N study. This N is you know, fairly small. Uh, quite significant worse diagnostic sco scores. Worse procedural performance. So, diagnostic scores mean like their ability to be diagnosed. Yeah, diagnose. yeah. Ser serial diagnostic challenges yeah. through, a ca through a simulated case mm -hmm. and procedural ones. And it, it goofed up the way they interacted with each other with information sharing and help seeking. Like they were more reluctant to reach out to each other. I mean, they knew each other, yet they were more reluctant to interact, uh, even though they'd been working together. Interesting, huh? So rudeness decreased the quality and amount of information sharing, which resulted in worse diagnostic performance. They connected those two. And then it decreased the amount of help seeking with harms to procedural performance. If they didn't talk about the procedures, they didn't do as well with them, as much, you know. Which we know, because you know, for procedures these days, there's all these checklists where you talk about them and, and click off different things before you do the procedure. So that makes a lot of sense. Was this shared with like surgeons? No, just, just neuro intensive care unit people. Mm -hmm. So any, any comments about that? What do you think? Do a study with a simulated patient is nice in addition to rudeness. Yeah. Actually, I think it's a study of consultants because this has come up with our um, with Jerry's consults, consults and you know, the consults where the, the way that we interact with each other, I think, impacts um, the consultation and can have like impact on because there was a big case with QI a couple years ago with the Jerry patient who um, ortho had consulted and wasn't seen. And there was, I think, a lot of bad blood there. The patient ended up dying and there was a huge QI. And, and I think it does impact the way consultants work with each other because if you're rude and you don't want to help somebody, Dr. Taz is always telling us never to be rude <laughs> to get consults or when we give recommendations. And I think it impacts the quality of the discussion we're having. Right, yeah. You're asking this less much less likely to agree. I, I feel like I have the the feeling that I can disagree with them just because they're because not they're nice. Attitude, yeah. <laughs> and I don't like them. Yeah, like yesterday I called somebody to say the patient has subarachnoid hemorrhage and instead of being like, oh really? And of course I was like, how do you know? <laughs> Why would you diagnose that with this? And, I, and it was like two in the morning and I said, you know, we're both tired. <laughs> Let's be nice. That's good. See the patient. That's a good intervention. But, yeah, it was just like, of course I know. Yeah, this is a summer actor. I'm really going to let you know. Yeah. But it really impacts, like, in that moment, it impacted, like, the, how quickly he was going to come see the patient, and how likely he was to believe me that uh, my exam, or he kept questioning my exam. Um, and, 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 I mean, I know there's a lot of tiredness that's played with this, too, like, resident exhaustion. Like, oh, sure. Even with attendings, like, the consultant to consultant. Um, politeness really impacts yeah, patient right. care. David? I, you know, the way this was designed is it, it wasn't inter-provider rudeness, it was like a, it was like feedback. Yes. So it was like, I mean, the, is it that negative feedback actually negatively impacts performance? Yes. And of course, the converse, if you want to believe the converse, is that positive feedback might positively improve performance. Yeah, no, you're right. It's, you know, negative yeah. feedback was the old school, right? You know right. I mean? Quite right. Yeah. Yeah, you're right, David. The flavor of the, the rude comments had a feedback element to them. So, yeah. And that was consistent. They didn't mix it up with, uh, you know, I don't like the way you're doing your hair today. No, same comments. Yeah, they verbatim were the. Was what the I mean is the whole category of comments related to 
medical practice in Israel something a little bit negative. It wasn't specific right. to what the king was doing, but it related to medicine. They weren't just rude about the weather or... Right. Okay. Exactly. Right. Yeah, I mean, some of the comments I think are more likely, similar ones you may hear from unhappy patients or families, so that's kind of more than uh -huh. between providers, but, you know, comments like that you may hear from, yeah, a patient or a family. Right. I think that seems more applicable to that situation than uh, a consultant in the you know, two term position. Yeah. How do you all respond to that? I mean, the, the tragedy there is patients are usually basically just trying to be heard. You know, they're crying out for attention, yet they're pushing us away. So, uh, go ahead. Well, but I think if we all are honest with ourselves, we often make broad comments uh, like that. We hear about other institutions or about other specialties, right? We worked at another hospital where the joke was the greatest thing about the emergency department was it was right next to a really good hospital. Because the care there was, was so, so poor. Uh, and I think we also have to be mindful of those statements that we make in front of families as, as well. Right. You know, we get a lot of people referred to us, and I think we really need to be circumspect about what we say and to recognize that sometimes the person with the hardest job is the first person to see the patient, not the third person yeah. to see the patient. And you never know who's listening. Right. Yeah. Uh, Forty years ago, Lee Goldman, who was chairman of medicine, was chairman of medicine at UCSF, wrote a paper called The Ten Commandments of Consultation, which are great for regardless of what kind of consultation you do. And it just had to do with human interaction, you know, being tactful, uh, looking for yourself, uh, being mindful of your turf and not making suggestions or recommendations that don't have anything to do with your expertise. It's a wonderful paper. I'll still use it. Mm -hmm. Pam? Um, it's interesting. I'm a nurse practitioner, but I was a nurse at UCSF um, 20, 25 years ago, and they brought in this big team of, you know, kind of slick us up and help get our, our patient satisfaction ratings up. But a lot of what they focused on was talking nicely about each other. Um, and it, it really is a lot of the same stuff. Um, so we would say, uh, for instance, if you're going on shift, you'd say, Oh, Mary's going to be your nurse tonight. She's fabulous. You know, and, and it felt just so stupid. And we had to go to these things and rehearse that. But, you know, we all dutifully kind of did it. And then you started kind of liking people. And you started even, you know, you think of something nice to say about somebody who is a, you know, a jerk or something that, you know, it's like, oh, she's got gorgeous red hair and, you know, or something like that. <laughs> it, it actually worked and it actually changed the atmosphere. They also taught us things like when, you know, you're rushing back from lunch and you and the patient both get to the elevator or the stairwell at the same time, you step back and let the slow patient go ahead of you. You know, those kind of things, but it actually created a much better environment that lasted about a year. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not unlike the, what they have us doing now, this aided business, you know, you know, you know about the, you know, acknowledge the patient, introduce yourself, tell them what's going to happen, thank them at the end. Go ahead, Bruce. I, I was just uh, thinking you brought up, uh, or someone did, uh, what life was like 30 years ago if you were a, uh, you know, a, a high-powered internal medicine rotation. Uh, it was customary, it was culturally correct for the attending to occasionally be pretty harsh and pretty direct to the point that today a, a current medical student at this institution would blanch and probably leave the room crying. Yeah. And this is not to put anybody down, but it's just to say that there's been a cultural shift. So that rudeness would be partly to find out what the recipient to the comment concluded. Uh, right. If it was culturally appropriate, and I think it was 30 years ago, to listen to this kind of stuff, no one reacted much. Oh, yeah. I was certainly subject to it yeah. as a med student. Go ahead. I, I guess the result doesn't seem altogether that um, surprising. I mean, you wouldn't take your car to a mechanic and start off by insulting and saying how badly the operations were. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I mean, I, I do think that we should be held to a higher standard than car mechanics, but uh, the same thing, I, I think we're all affected by the environment in which we work and, and the sentiment. Um, and I, I bet if they did the same experiment, rather than having a patient be really insulting, have one of the team members insult each other, you might get some good results. 
Yeah, no doubt. And to be fair, though, like uh, it, it does impact a lot of our care because we have gone through a patient or a family who's really nice. You definitely are going to say, "Oh, this family is so great," and we I've seen people go above and beyond. I've seen people like insist that they stay in the ICU to get high level of care just because they're such a nice family. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody it puts their like everything into it. Versus if you're a fam if you're a person who's like extremely rude and difficult to get along, it impacts the people who are taking care of you. Um, you're not getting donuts every day for the rest of the team, and it impacts the way everyone perceives. And we we've had many cases of this where the rudeness has really impacted their care. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, I mean, you notice it with people who are rude, and you know, they you instead go through the nurse when you're in questions like the nurse asks you this patient had this question and you're like oh well you can tell them this <laughs> and you know uh -huh. because if every time you go in there and they start yelling at you it's just not a conducive environment for you to be happy or for them to be happy in mm -hmm. so and I think what's interesting with this that's how it sort of spread to everything where everything sort of was impacted and I don't exactly know how you work that bias out because you're going to be impacted by it because by sure. human nature, like you respond better to people who are next to you. Right. I guess if you're aware that you can say, well, if this were Mrs. So and so, I would, would I do better. this? <laughs> yeah. Or would I do this? I had, uh, when I uh, first got back into neurology, I had a patient. And I did my first year in the University of Oregon, and I had a patient, uh, uh, Afro-American woman who had ALS, and she was really angry at me, just really pissed off. And my father uh, died of ALS, and this was after this had happened. My father, that died of when I was off there intern. And uh, so I didn't know what to make of it, but I just let her talk and so forth. And uh, each week she got better and better. And finally started talking about her illness and so forth like that. So she was, you know, mad at her illness and taking on me. But also, as she said at the end, every six weeks another resident comes in and I have to uh, deal with them and so forth. Right. So she felt also abandoned and so forth, or get a resident that wouldn't listen to her or something. Yeah. This is my palliative care side coming out, but I'll, I'll, there's something to be said for just in, instead of recoiling, just leaning in. And, and letting somebody go until they run out of gas uh, is very therapeutic. Go ahead. For the, for the types of patients that you're talking about, there's a, a literature, the topic, topic is called the hateful patient. It's yeah. Worth, it's worth reading. A lot of it is in the bioethics literature. Uh, the first step is to really step back and ask yourself, well, what is it that's motivating them? Because sometimes it's not you. In fact, frequently it's not you, but sometimes it is. Yeah. Uh, and then the other type of patient is the disruptive patient. That's, mm -hmm. that's the other one that you have to make a mistake. Right. There should have been a third arm here. Mm -hmm. The rude comments and the neutral comments, there should have been the incredibly encouraging. Right. I'm unbelievably impressed with the quality of medicine in Israel. Yeah. yeah. I've never seen anything like this in yeah. my department. My department has people like Dr. Swanson. <laughs> 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 this goes on and on because one of the parameters measured is the quality of diagnostic accuracy. Right. So it's as if it changes the efficiency with which your brain works. Forget about all the oh I'm a you know I feel oppressed or I feel yeah. like I'm not worthy or something. It seems to make people think better, and I'm a little perplexed by that. I'm struggling to find a good neuro neurobiological. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. I'll let you go. Thanks, everybody.